An epic war has raged between the evil white wizard and the T-Squires, a battle that has endured for decades. And the battle we're referring to is none other than the one against HIV. So let's draw in our white wizard here, who will represent HIV, also known as human immunodeficiency virus. And we've aptly titled this character the White Wizard because HIV targets the white blood cells, specifically those with the CD4 determinants. But before we give the plot away, let's go over some viral basics. HIV is a member of the lentivirus genus, which is part of the retroviridae family. All members of this family are retroviruses, and HIV is no exception. We'll come back to what this means in a bit. The vast majority of untreated HIV infections eventually lead to AIDS, or Acquired Immunodeficiency Syndrome, which, like the name suggests, is an immunocompromised state. Notice he wields his power through a crutch-like staff, our recurring sketchy symbol for immunocompromised. There are in fact two types of HIV, HIV-1 and HIV-2. HIV-1 causes the majority of infections worldwide, in nearly all cases in the U.S. HIV-2, represented by the White Wizard's Apprentice, is less virulent than its HIV-1 counterpart. This means that it is less infectious and causes a much slower decline in the host's immune system. Also, HIV-2 is less commonly seen in the U.S. than HIV-1, but can be found in certain regions of the world, including West Africa, Portugal, Spain, and India. HIV is a single-stranded, RNA-positive virus. Notice the warm orange hues, representing an RNA virus, plus the positive scent sun. As we mentioned earlier, HIV is a special kind of RNA-positive virus, a retrovirus. This means the virus converts its RNA to DNA by an accompanying enzyme known as reverse transcriptase, or, in wizard lingo, reverso transcriptum. But our genome is DNA. Well, it's no small coincidence. HIV goes through all the trouble of reverse transcribing its genome to DNA to actually integrate into the host cell genome. The virus replicates along with the host DNA, which is why, as you can imagine, it causes a chronic infection. Okay, let's move on to the structure of the HIV virion. At the very core is the genetic material. HIV has a diploid genome, meaning each virion contains two copies of its positive sense single-stranded RNA genome. See the two orange dragons at the very center of the wizard's cap? Orange for RNA, of course. The RNA strands and their accompanying reverse transcriptase are surrounded by a conical, i.e. cone-shaped capsid, hence the wizard's cone-shaped hat. Before we move on, a little disclaimer. We're going to be talking about a lot of different proteins, all with letters in front of numbers. GP120, GP41, P24, and so on. Unfortunately, the structure of HIV is something that is often tested. Normally, these are exceptionally tedious to try to remember, but luckily, you have Sketchy. And this kind of stuff is our bread and butter. So don't worry, we'll make this memorable for you. There are three broad categories of proteins. We'll go into these more in-depth in the next video, but for now, the three categories are GAG, group antigen proteins, i.e. capsid proteins, POL, for polymerase, i.e. reverse transcriptase, and ENV, for envelope proteins. Luckily, we've already knocked out one category, and that's POL. The only protein you need to remember for POL is reverse transcriptase. GAG proteins are associated with the viral capsid or the inner shell of the virus. The capsid is composed of many subunits of the P24 protein. To remind you that P24 is associated with the capsid, we've drawn this sundial on the brim of the wizard's hat. 24 hours a day for P24. And just as a brim surrounds the wizard's conical core hat, so too do these capsid proteins surround the viral core. The capsid is itself surrounded by another layer. Next comes an interwoven matrix that connects the core to the envelope. Here, you'll find the P17 matrix protein. Our wizard has come prepared for battle, protected by a chainmail undercoat and a dagger and sword combo that form the number 17. Remember, the chainmail undercoat is to remind you that the P17 matrix proteins are found beneath the viral envelope. Directly overlying the P17 protein shell is the envelope. The envelope is composed of a lipid bilayer studded with glycoproteins. These ENV proteins, or envelope glycoproteins, are actually complexes of two glycoproteins, or GPs, 
there's GP41 and GP120. Both exist as trimers, or triplicate polymers. We'll represent both glycoproteins with the wizard's pipe. GP41 is a transmembrane protein, so we have 41 here on the stem, or the mouthpiece of the pipe. Also, notice that the stem of the pipe is reaching deep into the wizard's enveloping robe pocket, just like a transmembrane protein extends deep into the membrane of the envelope. GP120 is the outer glycoprotein that will eventually come in contact with host receptors. So we've incorporated a 120 into the outermost part of the pipe here, the bowl of the pipe. HIV specifically targets the host's CD4-positive immune cells, which includes both helper T lymphocytes and macrophages. Notice the wizard about to face off against this helper squire who has a four-shaped strap incorporated into his outfit. He represents a CD4-positive T lymphocyte, also known as helper T cells. The wizard's tower even has our symbol for macrophages. These macro cages, complete with four shaped chains to remind you that macrophages are also CD4 positive. It's no coincidence that HIV targets CD4 positive immune cells. As it turns out, the primary receptor for HIV is CD4, a factor found on the surface of the immune cell. In order to gain entry into the host cell, HIV must also bind a co-receptor from the chemokine receptor family, either CCR5 or CXCR4 represented by a CCR5 banner and CXCR4 flag. CCR5 is associated with T cells and macrophages, while CXCR4 is primarily found on T cells. Generally, HIV is tropic towards one of the two co-receptors, meaning it has a preference for one or the other. HIV strains that use the CCR5 co-receptor are known as R5 viruses. These predominate early in the course of HIV infection. We know that CCR5 binding is an important virulence factor in part because we've seen some individuals with CCR5 gene mutations that make these individuals virtually resistant to HIV. They can maintain normal CD4 counts and don't progress to AIDS. This is why the CCR5 co-receptor is an important therapeutic target. Learn more in Sketchy Farm. However, the majority of hosts are susceptible to HIV's ability to enter the cell through binding the CCR5 co-receptor. And, like other viruses, HIV has developed the ability to acquire new virulence factors that enable its entry into host cells. In fact, later in the course of infection, some HIV strains acquire the ability to use CXCR4 as a co-receptor. Those that exclusively use CXCR4 are known as X4 strains. And just so you know, some viral strains can actually use both co-receptors and are therefore known as R5X4 viruses. Let's move on to transmission. HIV is transmitted through body fluids, represented here by the wizard set of potion models. The red one is easy. HIV is a bloodborne pathogen, so exposure to infected blood through a contaminated needle poses a risk for contracting the virus. HIV can also be transmitted through blood and organ donation. Fortunately, though, broad screening practices have reduced the risk of transmission in these cases to a very low level. HIV is also transmitted sexually. Hence the less colorful potions, which represent semen as well as rectal and vaginal fluids. HIV can also be passed through the placenta to the growing baby. Note that transmission can also occur during labor and delivery or through breastfeeding. Once a person is infected with HIV, the disease progresses through a series of stages. Oh, watch out! Can, can, can I come out yet? Is it safe? <clears throat> I mean, uh, come on, be brave. Unfortunately for the squires, the wizard is firing off bolts of orange and blue magic. Fortunately for us, these brilliant magic beams illuminate some key points. The orange beam of light represents the level of HIV viral RNA in the plasma. This RNA level is also known as the viral load. The blue beam, on the other hand, represents the CD4 T cell count. And you'll notice it's taking out a poor helper T squire. Initially, HIV replicates unchecked because the host's immune system has yet to fully develop a response. The result is a rapid increase in viral RNA. This is accompanied by a decline in the blue CD4 plus T cells, at least temporarily. During this early stage, many patients develop symptoms of acute HIV infection, also known as acute retroviral syndrome. This presents with a cluster of nonspecific symptoms, sometimes described as mono or flu-like. 
think fever and fatigue. Take note of the recurring feverish flame helmet, and pay attention to where this creature is standing, namely right below that early spike in viral load. The symptoms typically resolve on their own within a few weeks thanks to a robust immune response, including the production of anti-HIV antibodies. These antibodies act to neutralize circulating viruses, which leads to a decrease in viral load. After this initial acute phase comes a long asymptomatic period known as clinical latency. This lasts about 8 to 10 years, or around a decade. Okay, now back to the story. Check out this book's location. It's above where that orange RNA beam has flattened out somewhat and hasn't yet shot up again. This flattening off happens because the host's immune response is keeping the virus in check, to some degree, but only to some degree, because HIV is doing its darndest to destroy CD4 helper T cells. Also note that the book is above where that blue beam, the CD4 count, is slowly decreasing, but hasn't totally tanked. But unfortunately, if the infection progresses unrecognized and without intervention, clinical latency comes to an end. By this point, the CD4 count is starting to tank, and it's no coincidence that this is when the viral load starts to drastically increase. Notice how that blue beam is attacking the squire on the floor while the orange one takes a sharp turn upward. The virus has depleted the host CD4 cells so much so that the immune system can no longer fight off the infection. At this point, the body is in an immunocompromised state known as AIDS. To be technical, there are two ways to diagnose AIDS. The first is based on CD4 counts alone. Anything below 200 is, by definition, AIDS. The presence of an AIDS-defining illness is the second way to diagnose AIDS. These tend to start occurring around a CD4 count of 200 anyway, but not necessarily below 200. So what exactly is an AIDS-defining illness? Well, these are characteristic syndromes that occur as a result of immunosuppression due to the depletion of CD4 T lymphocytes. Many of these illnesses are opportunistic infections, including fungal, bacterial, viral, and protozoal infections. Basically every type of infection, hence the array of lanterns on our wizard's shelf. Certain malignancies can also be AIDS-defining. These are often mediated by an oncogenic virus, like EBV, HPV, or HHV8 the virus that causes Kaposi's sarcoma. Normally, an intact immune system prevents these viruses from causing malignancy. However, the chronic immunosuppressive state from AIDS allows them to run wild. As you travel the sketchy universe, you may come across an AIDS ribbon here and there. This represents an AIDS-defining condition. All right, finally on to testing for HIV. Screening for HIV typically starts with the fourth generation test. This can detect the presence of HIV-1 and 2 antibodies and the HIV P24 antigen. That's why this skillful archer is decked out in a combo of 1 and 2 antibody arrow quivers and a 24 sunburst dial. The test is positive if either antibody or antigen is detected. If the fourth gen test is positive, the next step is an antibody differentiation immunoassay. In most cases, this will confirm the presence of antibodies and differentiate between HIV-1 and HIV-2. Notice the two different antibody arrows. This is here to remind you that this follow-up test can differentiate between the two. But what if the fourth gen test is positive, but the follow-up antibody tests are negative? Well, remember, fourth gen comes back positive for either antibodies or P24 antigen you've likely detected the P24 antigen, which means the patient is very early in the infection, i.e. acute HIV without seroconversion. You see, HIV antibodies need time to develop, so there is a so-called serological window between infection and the appearance of antibodies several weeks later. But certain tests that detect pieces of the virus become positive much earlier on. This includes the P24 capsid protein as well as viral RNA. This swarm of gnats in the window next to the positive sense RNA sun are here to remind you that nucleic acid testing, or NAT for short, is used to detect HIV RNA. NATs can detect HIV before seroconversion, that is, during the serological window. And that's it for HIV Part 1. Check out the sequel to find out just what kind of operation the wizard is running as we do a deep dive into the HIV virus's life cycle.